This is Bigger Questions with your host, Robert Martin. Welcome to Bigger Questions. Today's big question, where are the voices of hope? We're asking today's big question to Jazz Thornton. Jazz is a young New Zealander who is the co-founder of Voices of Hope, which provides help and hope to those struggling with mental illness. She advocates for those with depression, anxiety, and suicidal thinking all around the world. Jazz is also the award-winning director of Jessica's Tree, and her story is the focus of a new feature documentary film, The Girl on the Bridge. And she joins me now. Jazz, welcome to Bigger Questions. Hi, thanks for having me. It's great that you can join us today. Now, Jazz, as we begin today's conversation, we are going to engage some fairly difficult and challenging issues as we confront big questions of mental illness and suicidal thinking. Now, Jazz, it might be uncomfortable to talk about these big questions, but do you think it's important to open up conversations about these kind of topics? Absolutely. Um, they say, statistics say one in four people battle a mental illness. So if it's not you, it's someone that is close to you. So it's very important to be talking about it. Well, Jazz, maybe we start with your story then, because it's pretty foundational to the work that you do. Now, you've said that you've had a, a pretty rough childhood and upbringing. So can you tell us a bit about what your childhood was like? Yeah, sure. Um, So I grew up in a very small town in the South Island of New Zealand. And when I was three years old, um, the course of my life, I guess, kind of began to shift. And I was being sexually abused by a couple of different men within my life. And I started to respond and behave in, in different ways. My child protection files say that I went from being happy and bubbly to dull and lacking emotion. And I guess the rest of my childhood and teenage years as well, I guess, was kind of trying to get that bubbly and happy that was was taken as a kid and then there was a lot of a lot of bullying in school and a lot of stuff that was going on um so yeah it was it was a pretty pretty rough start to life Mm. and so then for you that was obviously a challenging childhood and and then things sort of spiraled downwards even further can you tell us what, what happened when you got a bit older Yeah, so when I was 12, I made a decision that no 12-year-old should ever make, and I made the decision to try and end my own life. And that then kind of led to the rest of my teenage years being spent in and out of psych wards and trying to take my life multiple times, which also led me to being, you know, homeless. I lost my job, kind of everything possibly wrong that could could happen went wrong. Um, And so my teenage years were very much spent battling these demons and these, you know, these things that were horrible to be uh, fighting. Yeah. You attempted to take your own life at 12 years old and that's, life must have been pretty bad for you to have even contemplated that. Yeah. I mean, with everything going on and everything going on at school and at home, I genuinely didn't think there was any other way except to do that. That was that was mm. the only thing, the only course of action that I thought I could take. Even, and I don't know if as a 12-year-old I knew, you know, the reality of that, but I don't think that I cared. I just wanted the pain to end. But what's going through the head of uh, someone contemplating taking their own life? For everyone, it's, it's different. But the main things that seem to kind of come across from both myself and lots of people that I now encounter is the full beliefs that the world is better off without you. You're a burden. You're unlovable. You don't deserve to be here. You don't deserve to be happy. And that to you and in your mind is fact. You see that as fact, not just something that could be a belief that this is factual. The world is better off without me. So that's kind of the, the thought pattern that yeah mm. comes with it. Yeah. So is there anything that particularly drives that thought pattern? Uh, you know, a key, is, there, is there anything that tips you from saying feeling bad to then actually wanting to end it all and thinking that the world will be better off without you? Again, I think it's different for everyone. Mm-hmm. For me, there was a whole lot of situations and it could be, there could have been really nothing that happened and I would just click one day and go, oh, I don't want to be here and would run and try and attempt. I think especially when I'm looking at COVID and the pandemic, isolation is a big thing mm. when you feel like you're alone or if, you know, someone say something or there can be small things that can eventually tip you over. But again, it's not something that is one thing fits all. Mm. They do say that one of the key elements for people feeling uh, like taking their own life is a loss of hope. How, how true is that? Very true. Yeah, if you're contemplating taking your own life, then you don't believe that there is hope for it to get better or that there's hope for a future, that there's hope for anything to change. Uh, Loss Mm. of hope is, I think, the most significant thing. So when you were 12, though, that wasn't the only time that you attempted suicide. You attempted suicide uh, numerous times uh, in your teenage years. Now, it's a a truly dreadful experience uh, to think about. Was it the same thing recurring or was it different things that were were triggering you to, to contemplate this? 
Uh, when I was younger, it was very much just like a, I can't live like this anymore. And I don't think I necessarily wanted to die. I just didn't want to live in the way that I was and I couldn't see any way out. As I got older, it very much just became the full fundamental belief that the world was better off without me. And there were things that that would happen, like, for example, losing my job because of my mental health pushed me over the edge, being homeless pushed me over the edge. All of these, you know, situations that would happen um, would do that. But ultimately it was the, the beliefs that I guess kind of pushed me there for most of those years. Hmm. So you attempted suicide numerous times as a teenager. So then what changed? Why wasn't there uh, another attempt? Uh, after the final one, I had a conversation with someone um, that I talk about now all over the world and is really the the fundamental thing that I guess I share in my message. And she came in after that final attempt and I remember just bawling my eyes out and she looked at me and was just like, Jazz, why are you crying? And I turned to her and said, I'm just so tired of fighting. And she looked at me and went, well, Jazz, what do you think the definition of fighting is? Because I don't think that you're fighting. I think you're only surviving. And it's only when you learn how to fight, that's when the change that you're longing to see is going to happen. And I remember taking that and I was a little bit offended at the start because I was like, I've yeah. been fighting for the last nine years. What are you talking about? But um, I looked up the definitions and, and the definition of surviving is to continue to live or exist in hardship, manage to keep going in difficult circumstances. And I realized that's very much what I had been doing for all of these years um, because the definition of fighting was to engage in a battle or war, fight to overcome and destroy an adversity. And that's very different to the definition of surviving. How did it change you? Just to unpack the, the process a bit more. So after realising these definitions, surviving versus fighting, I realised that fighting, um, the second word in that definition was the word engage, to engage in a battle or war. And for many years, I had been going into things like therapy with the mindset that my illness was my identity, therefore it will never change. So I'm going to go into this mm. room, not listen or care to anything that you say because this is who I am, therefore nothing you say or do is going to change that that was surviving. Going and fighting was being willing, okay, this person has gone and they have studied for what, like five years to be able to learn these tools, they might know what they're talking about. And I started to do um, these things like I wrote down my core beliefs on a piece of paper, which were I'm a burden, I'm unlovable, don't deserve to be here, drew a line. And on the other side, I wrote down everything that people said or did that contradicted those beliefs. So it was like all of these little practical things that was me learning how to engage and how to fight that, you know, I, I wrote a letter called Dear Suicidal Me that was to my future suicidal self. Yeah, it was all these little practical things that eventually kind of led up to being able to be where I am now. So what did you write to yourself then in your in your letter? Uh, it was uh, when you are struggling with mental health and suicidal tendencies, psychologists will often talk to you about safety plans. And if you've ever been in that place, you'll know what a safety plan is. And it is something like no one really uses it who's struggling because it seems so cheesy. And so what I did is right. that I took it and I, I put it in like a letter format. So it was basically, you know, dear suicidal me, I know that right now it feels like you can't do it, but this is what you're fighting for. I wrote down my dreams. This is who you're fighting for. The people that I don't want to leave behind. This is how you fight. You know, don't listen to sad music like you always do. It makes you feel worse. You know, put on inspirational music, pick up the phone, call a friend, uh, all of these practical things. That was kind of this letter that I could go back to any time that I had the urge to just get up and run away. Yeah, it, it really, I used that letter a lot. And after I wrote that, I never again attempted. So it made a difference? Oh, significantly, yes. A, a very, very large difference. I encourage everyone now that comes into my world that is struggling to do that. Now, wasn't there also a key faith experience which was important to you as well in your journey? I mean, do you mind unpacking a bit that and sharing about what happened there? Uh, it was very, very early 2017. I had been in the psych ward for months and uh, I went into a Quipper's church, which is a church here in Auckland, and there was a man who was speaking and he was sharing his story about being in a drug-induced psychosis and the TV was talking to him and there was all of these different things going on and he was sharing the story about how it got to a point he was lying on his bedroom floor just crying out going, God, I don't know what is going on, but I cannot live like this anymore. Please, you you have to move. You have to do something. And then he talks about that in that moment, he was completely set free. And I remember sitting there in this service, which was one of my first ones back after many years. And um, 
just going, I don't know what this looks like. I've been learning how to fight over the last, you know, few months. And I know that there has to be something more than this. And I don't know what this looks like. I don't know what living without this looks like because it was scary. All I had known was, you know, this process, all I had known was people being involved in my crisis or having the control of knowing that at any point I could take my own life and having Mm. to, um, and, and that moment after I heard the story, I made the decision and, and stepped out. Um, he was doing an, an altar call and I went down and he ended up uh, pointing me out, out out of like probably about 200 people that were down there. And I was the only one that he did and he started praying and prophesying over me. And from that day, I remember just feeling like overwhelmingly um Overwhelmingly loved, I guess, is probably the way to express it. And as someone who, whose belief that had made her suicidal for so many years was I'm unlovable, it just shifted something in me, um, significantly shifted something in me. And yeah, that's kind of that's kind of what happened. <laughs> so you talked before about obviously shifting your core beliefs about yourself. And so in this sense, was it almost like being born again in some sense? Yeah, yeah, I guess you could say that. I think um, there had been months where I had had to learn how to fight and there had been times previously where I had gone and, you know, responded in that way and nothing had happened. And Mm. what I had learned is that it's very much a a thing of, okay, and I actually preached this message at our um, our church conference here called Shout where it was very much, okay, when I move, then God moves. And when God moves, what happens? I have to move again. So it's Mm. kind of this, you know, back and forth sort of thing and I think that for many years I wanted to live without this but I didn't want to live without the crisis of you know my, the relationships that are built upon my crisis or live without the control so that day making that decision to step out despite all of those fears definitely was like that. Mm. Now, there is a passage in the Old Testament from the book of Jeremiah where the prophet Jeremiah was writing to God's people, the Israelites, who were in exile. Now, they'd been defeated, captured and deported to Babylon, which was the most powerful nation on earth at the time. Now, it seemed a pretty bleak, hopeless situation for them, but then Jeremiah brought a word from God to the nation of in Jeremiah 29, 11, where the Lord says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Now, Jazz, this is speaking about the nation of Israel when they were in a seemingly hopeless situation. So, but what extent then does the offer of hope from God and a future speak to you? I remember when I was sitting in the intensive care unit of the psych ward, and it's bad when you're in the intensive care unit of a psych ward, and I probably hadn't showered in like a week. My hair was in a messy bun. I was in a tracksuit. I had lost my job. This is when I was out, you know, was on the street, had nowhere to go. And these two people who are pastors at Equipus Church came in to the psych ward to see me. And I remember them sitting down and just looking at me. And about halfway through the conversation, they said, Jazz, I genuinely think one day your story is going to change the world. And I looked at them and I was like, I'm in a psych ward. I'm homeless. I have nothing. I have nothing. How could you say that one day my story is going to change the world? This makes no sense. And then not long after that, I kept hearing that same sentence from other people. There's an incredible um, prophet. I don't know if you know him, Dr. Michael Maiden. And he said the exact same thing to me um, in a corridor not long after I had got out going, Jazz, your your story's going to change the world and I think it's going to be sooner than you think. And it was only about a year and a half after that that I signed my first TV deal, became the youngest director in New Zealand to ever be funded to create a show which was on suicide, which was around the same time that I signed the deal for The Girl on the Bridge as well. And so, you know, in amongst everything that I now do, my whole organization is called Voices of Hope because when you Mm. are in those places, if you don't have hope for a future or have something to hope for, it's impossible to fight. And so having that that hope is really, really important. Mm. And so in some ways, this biblical hope that's that's seen here is reflected in, in your life and your story. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. And I'm very, very thankful for it. Jazz, you do have a powerful story and thanks for sharing some of it uh, today. And you just mentioned it has been made into uh, a feature movie length documentary, The Girl on the Bridge. So how do you feel though that your story has been turned into a film? 
it's weird <laughs> i think you know <laughs> yeah. this, this whole year of 2020 has been strange for me i i actually released a book at the start of the year yeah. that went went very well that was kind of about my story but the film is very different because they followed me for about two and a half years and I, at that point you know i'm in the media a lot over here i do a lot of a lot of tv i speak on very large stages like the un general assembly with world leaders and the royal family and the public and i guess society have only ever seen one side of me which is the person who is you know on stage strong fighting for the people but they don't see the 10 minutes after that that i get the phone call and someone's gone um and has lost their life or when I'm out literally trying to talk people off bridges or, or you know, the, the pressure of it. And I guess this film really shows that, which is scary. So it's a very vulnerable place to be in. But yeah. again, we've seen people find hope from it and that's the most important thing. Mm. So The Girl on the Bridge is screening now in selected cinemas and online. You can find out more at thegirlonthebridgefilm.com.au. So Jazz, how should someone prepare themselves before watching the film? Because it's not really a romantic comedy kind of film, is it? No, it's definitely not. I think you want to make sure that you are in the right space before you do watch it. It's not, um, it's not like super, super, super triggering or very dark, but it's it's very real mm. and it's you know it's very exposing as to what's going on in society and that makes people very uncomfortable. And so I think the best thing to do is if you can watch it with friends or family or loved ones, like don't don't do it by yourself if you can. Have people around so then you can have conversations afterwards and also make sure that you know all of the the helplines in in your area that you can contact. I do believe that they come up at the end of the film as well um mm. for they'll be specifically for australia as well um yeah. that you can access help and i think they're also on the website as well the girl on the bridge au. now the film has been described as a declaration of hope why is that <laughs> I actually don't know who was the first person to say that, um, but it's. I think it's very much, you know, we've taken this situation that is very grim um, and, you know, it was, it was a very difficult and a very dark subject. And over the two and a half years that we were shooting it, we managed to see change happen at a rapid pace. Mm. And it's the whole film was about taking something, I guess, that that nearly took me out and using it to try and change the world mm. and or change someone's world. Yeah. You mentioned before that the film makes you feel quite vulnerable. Um, so how do you react to the, the reaction to the film? I didn't actually get to watch the film itself until like probably the fifth cut. So maybe like three years after we had filmed, I guess the premiere was the first time that I really saw everyone's reactions to it here in New Zealand. And there was this big standing ovation and everyone was just crying. And the response from it was, you know, people feeling like, either they were understood for the first time or people saying that they understood now what was going on for other people for the first time. And that has been incredible. The response has been overwhelmingly positive and people really kind of understanding that this film is not just something that you watch and then move on with your life. Like it's the kind of film that you watch and you, you have to act afterwards. You have to do something. You have to, you know, you have to change something. Uh, and that's what we've started to see. Mm. Well, the film does form part of your broader work of advocacy uh, for those contemplating taking their own lives. And you have started an organisation called Voices of Hope. Uh, you've given a TEDx talk, you've written a book, as you've said. So how important is advocacy in this space? Is it, is it really common or widespread for people to contemplate taking their lives? Yes, yeah, 70% of all people will at one time uh, in their life have a suicidal thought. So it's very, very common. Advocacy, I think, is extremely, extremely important. Uh, and more recently, I've personally switched over from advocacy to activism because they're, they're two very different things, but both very important. And advocacy is so needed in our world because that's kind of, you know, the voice that will speak up for people, the voice that will say that we, we need change or the voice that will share the hope stories, which is really important. Important. And then activism is taking that and doing something about it. So, you know, mm. for me now, that's working alongside governments, getting in and speaking in front of the world leaders and saying, okay, this is how we can change this. Or what about looking at this kind of the crisis teams or the hospitals? How do we change these responses? So we've just now become very aware that this is something that we're going to talk about whether the older generation like it or not, mm. because it has to be talked about. Mm. So why do you think people not want to talk about it? 
I think that there's a whole generation that grew up not talking about it, that grew up kind of with the, you know, talking about things makes you weak or uh, if it's kind of more severe mental illness, then you just get labeled as crazy and it's embarrassing mm. to have someone that you know, you know, struggle with a mental illness. And so I think there's kind of this big generational gap where people are very much, we don't talk about it just purely for the fact because they never grew up doing it. So it's so weird to them. And the younger generation who know that, you know, their entire friend group is struggling with depression. And this is something that we, we must talk about. But in the film, um, you see kind of uh, at one of the beginning scenes, the whole purpose that I created the, the series that I directed Jessica's Tree was because of comments that had come up on an article about a young girl who had tried to jump off a bridge to end her own life. And the comments on those articles were all from middle-aged men saying, if that was my daughter, I'd shoot her down. What an attention seeker. Hopefully oh, yeah. 50,000 volts worth of attention is being arranged. And that right there, pure example of the generational gap and why younger people struggle to speak up and why they will come to me and tell me that they want to take their own life and not tell their parents. And that's what we're trying to change. Yeah. Wow. That sounds like a very valuable and important work, obviously, for people who are struggling. You mentioned before you've alluded to it, but has COVID and lockdowns around the world, has that made things uh, more challenging? 100%. I think that we're about to see a whole second pandemic, which is going to be the mental health and suicide rates if we do not act now. People that are struggling with mental health, one of the key things we always say is to get around people. And when you take away the very thing that is needed to uh, to kind of better your mental health, which is family and community and friends and put people into isolation, things are going to escalate. Yeah, so I think kind of globally we are starting to see that, but also we are starting to see governments. I know Australia has actually done really well um, with the COVID pandemic mental health response. Um, and so while, you know, it's definitely, we have to be super aware and statistics are likely going to soar, we are still on the front foot of being able to combat that with how we respond now. Mm. So then what impact then have you seen from your work then, Jazz? You're an activist, advocate. What impact have you seen? <laughs> um, you know, thankfully I, I see we get to see great, great impact around the world, which is the only reason that I guess you can keep doing this work because it's very hard. But, you know, we get literally thousands of messages a day now of how either content that we've shared has saved literally save people's lives or systems that we're working on changing or, you know, New Zealand here uh, two years ago because of the public pressure that we managed to put on the government about mental health. New Zealand has one of the highest youth suicide stats in the world. It was like horrendously bad. There was so much media coverage we managed to get about it that mental health literally swayed our elections and the government put $1.9 billion invested into mental health. So you've got the kind of big scale wins that we're seeing, but also I'll get stopped on the street at least 10, 15 times a day from, you know, young people or older people who have found hope in our content. So it's been it's been pretty incredible. So the impact we're starting to see is is significant, but there's still so much more to be done. Now, Jazz, you live your life in the space of mental health and suicide, confronting some of the very worst challenges people face. It seems very intense. Do you get overwhelmed at times? It just gets a bit too much? Absolutely. Uh, all the time. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think for maybe a couple of years, I was kind of trying to run like a, you know, like superwoman going, I can do it all. And eventually it catches up on you. Yeah. And I'm surrounded by this 24 seven. But I'm very thankful to have amazing people around me who will, you know, take my phone off me and be like, Jazz, you're not even allowed to talk about mental health for the next hour um, <laughs> right, and things yeah. like that, which is really good um, yeah. because it is it is my world. But, yeah, I've got mm. people and myself who, you know, are making sure that, that I keep on the track with it. Yeah. Does your faith help you in that space as well? 100%. Yeah, both, both my faith and also the community that comes with it. My church community are everything to me and are incredible. So, yeah. Yeah. Now, Jazz, if you could go back and meet your 12-year-old self that day that you attempted suicide, what would you say to that 12-year-old girl? Oh, there are so many things that I would want to say. Um, but I think the, the biggest thing is the belief that I've talked about a lot during this call is um, the world is not better with, without you. You know, you think, you wholeheartedly think in that moment that it's never going to change. But in all things, there is hope. You know, mm. there's going to be so many things that you're going to face along the way, but ultimately hope will win. 
And if you were that 12 year old girl hearing that wisdom or that advice, how do you think that would have helped you? I think that it probably would have been able to save me from the years of attempts afterwards. Um, you know, just knowing that someone thought that the world was, or you know, verbally said that the world wasn't wasn't better with without me in it. Because I don't think we express our feelings and, and gratitude and love towards people that well. To be honest, people could think it, but you don't say it. You know, for, to actually know that was truth, I think would have done a lot. But also to know that this was only a season and the story of my life wasn't over yet, it was going to get better, I think, would have helped significantly in my teenage battles. Mm. Now, Jazz, if someone is listening now and feeling suicidal, what, what do you suggest they do? Uh, the very first thing that I suggest that you do is that you pick up the phone and you message someone. It's the scariest thing and it also is one of the most common things people say, you know, reach out, but it's not something that's, you know, a wishy-washy kind of, oh, just reach out to be boy, it'll be okay. You cannot do this by yourself. Isolation is not the answer and it's, it's really hard to battle if you don't have an army around you to do so. Mm-hmm. And so whether it be, you know, your favourite teacher, your parent, anyone that will listen and then if the first person doesn't listen, keep going until you find someone. You don't have to do this by yourself. Well, thanks so much for sharing today, Jazz, sharing your story and your work in advocacy and activism. Uh, I just want to close with today's uh, final question, today's big question. So, Jazz, where are the voices of hope? I think the voices of hope are everywhere. Um, the voices of hope is every person that is listening to this. When I'm in schools, I always talk about there's three people in every situation. You know, talking about bullying, for example, there's the victim, the bully, and the bystander. The person with the most power is the bystander. They're the ones who have the ability to, to choose whether they will speak up and intervene in a situation or let it happen. And so in every situation that we walk into, we have that decision. Are we going to choose to speak hope today or are we going to choose to to stay silent, but I think we are the ones who choose to speak hope. Well, let me leave you with some of the Bible's answer to the big question, where are the voices of hope? From Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. I look forward to you joining us next time for Bigger Questions. Thanks very much to our guest today, Jazz Thornton. Thanks for having me. 